We're in a series called The Art of Sticking Out, and today we're going to be closing up the series with a passage that's familiar for a lot of people. In, in this series, we've been exploring what it is to be called or what it is to be more than one of the crowd. We're called to be more than one of the crowd. Now, that's an interesting statement, and I know that it's kind of, it's kind of loaded. Our, Christ, our, our, our culture puts a lot of pressure on us to be unique, to be different in different ways. And so advertisers really play on this. And, of course, they're presenting things to you, all different kinds of things that's going to make you different from everybody else, going to make you unique and all of that. And so, you know, if you just buy this car or you just buy these clothes or if you just go on this vacation or if you just eat these foods, you're going to be so different from anybody else. So you go and, like, you watch the Super Bowl and you saw that car commercial and you go, oh, yeah, that's what I want. And so you go and you go purchase that guitar, that car. Guitar, it works with that too. But if you get that car, all of a sudden you start to realize there's tons of these things on the road. Did you ever notice that? Like all the cars, they're all like the same as yours. Or, or you go get those clothes, the clothes. I mean, if you buy the clothes, guess what? Tens of thousands of those same things have been made, and there's tens of thousands of people wearing the same exact thing. Not that special all of a sudden, right? Or the vacations that you take. Oh, well, you know, this was the vacation of the vacations. And when it's over, it was nice. But I mean, like really, what was it? What kind of impact, lasting impact did it have on you? Right? Or, or the food. I mean, food it goes in one end to out the other, and so no need to get graphic on that stuff. So what makes us different? Is it positions in business? I mean, is it, is it, is it wealth? Is it is it power? I mean, is the, you know, the lifestyles of the rich and famous? Maybe that's just what, what I need. I'm going to watch the shows about that. I mean, how many suicides have to happen among the, quote, rich and famous until we realize the answer's not there? Or we look at all the car accidents of those who are under the influence or, you know, this person took out their, you know, $200,000 car and, and trashed it completely, completely wrecked it. You know, and, and, on, and on we can go to the addictions and all this kind of stuff to make us realize, like, like, there's no difference between these that some might hold up versus the masses. They're all exactly the same, except they have better PR, they have people that go before them to put up this public relations front. And so when we're talking about sticking out from the crowd, we're talking about really sticking out. We're talking about something that in reality should be the norm for the follower of Jesus Christ, but which unfortunately has become a rarity. And so let's explain this stuff out. When we're talking about sticking out, we're talking about a person who is now beginning to embrace who they are before God. There's like my identity in Jesus Christ. I know who I am in him. I'm secure in that, and I'm secure as a person as a result. You know, we have an extreme identity crisis in our culture, don't we? We just drive on the road. So many people have identity crisis. I mean, why do people drive like absolute idiots? I mean, why when you're going down the road and it's, abs it's, it's packed traffic and there's been that road sign that's been flashing with the arrows on it says that lane's closed, but this person has to zoom up that side and get right in between you and that other car. So they're gaining 15 feet. Are they going to get anywhere faster? Or is there something going on with the person's identity? I've got to get ahead of you. I've got to be better than you. But see, for the believer in Jesus Christ, my identity is in him. My identity's in him. I'm not threatened by others. We're people, we're people who are called to grab hold of, of what Jesus has already grabbed hold of for us. We're not even making it happen. He's already ordained it. He's already set it out for us. He just wants us to start walking. And it's a person that's different from the crowd. It is one that starts walking in life that's marked by fullness. Life that has this undercurrent, this raging undercurrent of joy going through it. Doesn't mean it's on the surface all the time. Doesn't mean there's always happiness. But there is this thing when we are still before the Lord where that joy is just restored beautifully. It's a life that's marked by, by freedom, a freedom that is really free. It's a life that's marked by, by love, by love. Isn't that the prime characteristic, or supposed to be the prime characteristic of a follower of Jesus? And so being more than one of the crowd, being more than one of the crowd is 
I'm starting to walk in which God has already ordained for me to walk in. I'm, already, I'm starting to walk in the good works that he's prepared for me. And so if all of this stuff that I was just talking about, all this stuff is mine in Jesus Christ, then what can stand against me? It's not circumstances. It's not other people. It's only the me. And that's the whole point of the series. Today we have a familiar passage Familiar to many people. I mean, if it's, if it's new to you, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so, but whether familiar or not, most people don't get what's going on here. Just like many of the people in the first century didn't get what's going on here. And yet it was so significant that Jesus flat out tells them in verse 42 that the reason why you don't have peace is because you're missing this essential thing. Or look at how the New Living Translation puts it. It says, I wish, Jesus said, I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. If you don't have peace, what do you have? I mean, really, you think about it. If you don't have peace, what do you have? I mean, you could have amassed all the wealth that nobody's amassed as much as you had before. Yet, if you have no peace, what do you have? I mean, you could have fashion, you could have power, you could be the envy of all kinds of people. You can have that career, that position, that person. You, you, can, you can, like, have all these kinds of things, but if you don't have peace, what good does any of that stuff do for you? I have a friend in Zimbabwe, and um, she was there during the time of the elections a few years ago. And during that time of the elections, there was a lot of unrest. I mean, a lot of unrest. Um, the political power that was, the, the political party that was in power um, didn't want to lose power. I mean, go figure, right? Um, but what they did, they did some real nasty things in order to stay in power. Of course, the UN would come in and do their election observations, make sure it's all fair and all that stuff. But before that, they weren't in. And so they would go, the political party would go into different villages and they would take a person out and they'd torture them in front of everybody. So this is what's going to happen to you if you vote for the other side and you had to have a card that told you what political party you were of. So you want that card? This is what's going to happen to you. They would go into villages and raise the entire village. Whole villages would just be taken out. Lots and lots of people got killed. And it was, it was a hard time for a lot of the believers during that, during that time. And she said something to me that um, I'll never forget. I mean, obviously, I'll never forget. Um, she said to me, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and he's the Prince of Peace for a reason. Because if you don't have peace, nothing else matters. Nothing does. And so I understand. I, I, get, I get the drug addict. I get the alcoholic. I get to the person that's addicted to countless numbers, numbers of things. I get to the one that looks to the, the pill bottle. Peace is huge, huge. How can I get it? Anyways, it's, it's a big business, peace. It's something, it's the reason why it's big business is because it's something that's core to our beings. God's wired us for peace. It's code, DNA code, digitized. You know, God created, put it in us. The problem is peace doesn't come from so many places that people tell us it comes from. It doesn't come from your surroundings. You think it's going to. Your surroundings keep on changing. You'll know, you just won't have it. It doesn't come from your circumstances. It doesn't come from that person because they're acting like an idiot. And if they would just stop acting like an idiot, I'd be okay. It doesn't come from entertainment. It doesn't come from altered realities. It doesn't come from amassed pleasures. It doesn't come from wealth or landing that job. Peace only has one source. And you can protest it if you want. Solomon tried to protest it. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes as a result of it. Peace only comes from one source, and the source is God. It's God. It's His. So, you know, so many things belong to Jesus. So many things belong to God. So many, right? Joy, that's His. This doesn't exist outside of Him. Life, fullness of life, that, that's His. Forgiveness, that's, that's His. Love, I mean, real, real love. I'm not talking about, you know, we have friendship love and erotic love, all that kind of stuff. When I'm talking about love that's agape or agapeo love, love that lays down its life for others, that can think of another person before you think of self, esteeming others more than ourselves, right? Real love, life that's giving, a love that's, that's fulfilling, right? Um, that's God's. Peace. 
peace. All these things are God, and he freely gives them. The problem is, the problem is so many want these things, peace, love, joy, um, hope, all, all these things, without God. And then you wonder, like, well, why is all this dysfunction happening in my life all around me? Why is all this destruction going on? It must be everybody else. I'm the only normal one. Or why is all this distress happening? Why? Because these things aren't attributes of God. And that's the way a lot of times even a follower of Jesus can act like these are somehow like God's got these things in his pocket. He's just going to hand them out. So like, God, I need some, I need some more love. Would you just give me some more love? Oh, you need some, okay, yeah, I got a little bit of extra here for you. Or a little bit more peace, Lord. I need, I need, I need um, life over here, God. You know, there's this destruction here. You know, these things don't exist outside of him. They are who he is. You can't have God without having God. These things don't exist outside of him. To make a lame illustration of it, it's like having water, right? If you have water, H2O. And you could say, well, I don't want hydrogen. I, only, I want water, but I don't want the hydrogen part. Well, you, it's not water anymore. You need the hydrogen and the oxygen together. They come as one. That's water. And so it is with, with God. These aren't attributes of him. They're, part, they're who he is. And so peace in the art of sticking out. Jesus held his audience responsible for not receiving peace. He holds us responsible, too. So let's look at where we're going, what's available to us. We're going to run through this passage. Some of the events are really straightforward. Um, we're going to look at some prophecies in it and kind of explore some of them and how they all add to our peace. So let's start verse 28. When he said these things, he went up ahead, or he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near Bethphage, oops, when he drew near Bethphage, um, and Bethany, that the mountain called Mount Olivet, and he sent two of his disciples, sent two of his disciples ahead. Now, Jesus, at this point in time, is getting ready to head to Jerusalem. He's just got like four days left of, of his life. He was just eating at Simon the leper's house in Bethany. I think it's interesting, Simon the leper, I like that. The guy wasn't a leper anymore. He was an ex-leper, but he kept that title for himself. I think he kept it because it was a testimony. He was introduced to people. He would say, I'm Simon the leper. You know, people would react to that, pull back. But he said, no, I was healed by Jesus Christ. It also reminded him of who he was before Jesus all the time. So he ate at his house. At that house of Simon the leper was Mary um, and Martha. They also lived in Bethany and Lazarus, their brother. Remember Lazarus? He was the one that Jesus rose from the dead. He was dead four days in the grave. Jesus calls him forth. He's alive again. And lots of people in Bethany believed as a result. When a funeral happened in that, in that village, the whole village would go out to it. When Jesus rose him from the dead, everybody knew. Everybody knew. A lot of people believed on Jesus as a result of that. And you might go, well, of course they did. If somebody raised from the dead, I believe them too. Well, look what happened in, Matthew, in John chapter 12. A great many of the Jews knew that Jesus was there, and he came, and then he came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. They were just like amazed at that. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many Jews went away and believed in Jesus. See, unbelief, unbelief is not something that's just rational. It's a choice. And these guys are making a choice. I'm not going to believe in Jesus. And we know it's irrational. How many times did you hear somebody's testimony before you became a follower of Jesus? How many times did you hear people's testimony and you said, you said well, I'm glad it worked for you? Or, man, I, I don't know anything about that Jesus thing, but they sure do have a changed life. Well, what happened? What happened? Well, a lot of people do the same thing today, right? You share your testimony, and they go, I don't want to hear about it, right? But your life has been changed. And they might not be seeing somebody rise up out of the grave, but they're seeing something greater. And that thing that's greater is my eternal destiny has been changed because of Jesus Christ. So these, these are like, we just want to kill both of them now. 
Okay, so going on, that's where Jesus was. He was at this person's house, Simon the leper, Mary, Martha, Lazarus are there. And then he says to the disciples there, when they're done eating, go into the village opposite. You're going to find a cult on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. Now we could go on a whole bunch of, on a little bunch of rabbit trails here. Um, sitting on a colt that's never been sat on before. Uh, if you have ever had animals that you ride, you know that's the big no-no to do. Okay, but anyway, verse 31. And if anyone asks you, what are you lo- why are you loosing it? Thus say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So real simple instructions. Go up into the village, the village that we haven't been to in months at this point in time. Go up there and borrow a donkey without telling the owners that you're borrowing it. That's all. And if they ask you, say this to them. Now, the disciples knew Jesus by this time. You know, they've been walking with him for three and a half years. They knew Jesus knows things that we don't know. They, they knew that. They knew when Jesus gives his word, when he says to go and do something, when he gives the word, it's going to come to pass. And so whether he gives his word as a command or he gives his word as an instruction, it's going to come to pass. If it's an instruction, it's going to be as he says. If it's a command, if he's telling me to do something as far as a command, change some behavior, whatever it might be, he's going to give me the power. He's going to enable me to be able to do that. And this is huge. This is huge. Many people, many followers of Jesus missed this. And because of the result of missing this, peace is always elusive to them. Always out of reach. So a simple word like Jesus told to the disciples once, let's go to the other side of the lake. And they all get in a boat, go to the other side of the lake, you know, Sea of Galilee, and that storm arises. You know, Jesus said... Let's go to the other side of the lake. That meant that when the storm rises and we think we're going to drown and way too much water is coming into the boat, it means it's okay. We're safe. We're going to the other side of the lake. That's what it means. When Jesus says, go up into the village and you'll find a colt there, untie it and bring it to me, what that means is, I'm going to go find a colt and I'm going to untie it and bring it to him. Yeah, and there might be some weird stuff that happens in between there. But it's safe. He knows exactly what's going on. There's a lot of freedom here. A lot of freedom. We take ourselves, we take ourselves way too seriously. And we could think that a lot's riding on us and our choices and our ability to make things happen. Well, the fact is, when Jesus is prompting us to do something, when he gives us a command in his word, he is going to make sure these things come to pass. Verse 32. So those who were, who were sent went their way, and they found it just as he said to them, as they said to, said to him, them. Yeah, right. Um, but as they were loosening the colt, the owners said of it said to them, Why are you loosening the colt? And I don't know, like, were the disciples excited at this point in time? Were they apprehensive? I, you know, you kind of put yourself in their shoes. Like, Jesus just told us to go do something. Do you keep on guessing along the way? Well, I wonder what's going to happen when we get there. You go with apprehension, or do you go with excitement saying, I know he's going to do something. I get a front row seat at seeing God move. Because that's what he does, right? He does that a lot in our lives. He gives us a front row seat of watching him move. So here they go. Jesus told them what to say, right? And so they loosed the coat. The owner said to him, why are you loosening the coat? Ouch. What did he say for us to do? You know, he's like, you're not seeing anything. No, not that one. The Lord has need of him, right? Obviously, obviously, Jesus must have known the guy or the, the guy must have known them because they say the Lord has need of him and it's all good. It's all good. Verse 34 they said, the Lord has need of them. They brought them to Jesus. They threw their clothes on the coat and they set Jesus on him. In verse 36, and as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Now this is starting to turn into something, which was something just going to the feast of Passover, which is a huge and exciting thing. Now it's taking on its whole, whole nother creature it's becoming. 
People start getting excited. Jesus is riding on a donkey. People are taking off the clothes off of their back, literally, and they're laying them on the ground so that that donkey would walk on them and not on the dirt. Something's going on here. Now, this is where it's happening. It's a quick map here. We're in the southern part of the map. You see big Jericho there. We're down by the last three dots, Jerusalem, Mount Olives, Bethany, real, real close to the bottom there. I should have brought it up higher. But anyway, um, within a mile, mile and a half of Jerusalem at this point in time. If you go from Bethany, then you go up to the next hill, which is Mount Olives, and then from there, it just Mount Olives opens up, and there's Jerusalem before it. And actually, it, it's, quite, it's quite beautiful. What would happen is, if you were in Bethany, you would be going up this hill of Mount Olives, and as soon as you crest the peak of Mount Olives, Jerusalem would just be opening up, and the whole, the, the whole um, view would be Jerusalem. You know, it's kind of like around here. You know, sometimes you're driving, and you're cresting a hill, and it ever happened to you when you just crest it, and then there's just this gorgeous view. And if you've never spoken tongues before, you start to right then, right? Because it's just like, wow, God, this is amazing. That's like Jerusalem. I don't care how many times a person's been there. I don't think you could ever crest that hill and see that city and not go, God, this is unbelievable sight. Jerusalem is surrounded by valleys on every side. It sort of just sticks up right out of there. And so the Kidron Valley is right there below Mount of Olives. Actually, here's a picture of the eastern gate that Jesus would go through. He would be up on this hill, and he would come down into the valley, then go up into that gate that's closed off now, um, and then up into the Temple Mound where all those trees are. If the, down to the left of this picture is where the Dome of the Rock is. Beyond that is Alaska Mosque. Okay, But that's the Temple Mount area. Here's another picture of it. The reason why this gate is sealed, by the way, is because um, s some of the people of the area, um, the Muslims, knew that Jesus, when he was going to return, he was going to go through the eastern gate, and so they figured something out. We can stop him. Let's seal it off. That'll do it. You know, and then, they, and then just to make doubly sure, what they did was they put a whole bunch of tombs in front of it so that if he went through, he would get unclean by doing it. They forgot that he raises the dead. But it's, you know, one of those small things like that. But anyway, um, here it is, Jesus coming in. And you can kind of get the picture of what's happening. As they're cresting the hill, I mean, they've got a lot of people with them. They've got a lot of people traveling with them. I mean, probably the whole town of Bethany is with them. There's been people traveling with them right along. And then as they crest that hill, the entire valley's filled with people. There's two million people descending upon Jerusalem at this point in time. Okay, so a city of about 800, or I'm sorry, about 80,000. Some people say 600,000 or whatever. But, but a city around there with two million visitors coming in, the valley would have been filled. And here comes Jesus down. People are throwing their cloaks in front of it, and other people are looking on, and they're getting in and throwing their cloaks on. And then all of a sudden, people start shouting, and they start singing unto the Lord, singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Well, let's look at what's going on. Verse 37, and then as he's drawing near the descent of Mount Olives, the whole multitude of of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with loud voice for the mighty works which they had seen. And they'd seen mighty ones. Lazarus was there among them. Blind guys with them. You know, the leper, ex-lepers with them. Verse 38, and they began shouting, oh, blessed is the king who comes in the name of Yahweh. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Just every... Gospel records this event. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all recording Jesus' ministry. Everyone records this event. The song is sung by all different groups of people as Jesus is coming down into that valley. All different groups of people are coming out, and they're singing Psalm 118. This is from Psalm 118. It's a prophetic psalm. It's a psalm that the pilgrims would sing going up to the Temple Mount, desiring to see the Messiah come, and here he is coming down, and they're singing it right to him. Extremely high day. Extremely high day. So some of them are singing this part. Others are singing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Others are singing save us now, son of David. Come and save. You know, all, all different people singing this. Let's just grab a couple more verses. We're going to talk briefly about some of this stuff. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered them. He answered them saying, I tell you, I tell you, 
that if they should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Wouldn't that have been awesome? Just like, okay, everybody shut up. <laughs> you know, let's hear that. I mean, that would have been amazing. Chorus of stones going on. Rock music, just right there. <laughs> you know, creation did this day. Creation knew it. If praise would not be offered by humanity, then creation would no longer stay silent, and it would have praised him. And we could chase this thing, we could chase this rabbit down, but you guys don't have time for it. Look at, Roman, look at Romans 8, whole thing about the redemption of creation in there. But let me say this about this. If you're a person who says, well, I'm not going to praise him, you know, that's like just who I am. You know, I don't sing songs, so I don't praise him. I don't do this, I don't do that. You, you know what? Creation one day is going to say, step aside, child, and I'll show you what you were created for. It used to be a song, well, there is a song, it's not used to be, it's a song that one of the lines was, ain't no rock gonna cry in my place. As long as I'm alive, I'll glorify your holy name. And it goes right on through a whole bunch of different things. But I like that. Ain't no rock gonna cry in my place. Like, no rock is going to take my place of praising. Okay, quick here. Up until this point in time, Jesus has not been allowing himself to be proclaimed by the masses as Messiah. Okay, so in Matthew 8, verse 4, Jesus said um, to, um, to the leper, he said, go see that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest who offered the gifts that Moses commanded as a testimony to him. Tell, you, tell no one. Um, again, blind guys in Matthew, two of them, their eyes were open. Jesus sternly warned them, see to it that no one knows. Jairus, um, Jairus' daughter who died, Jesus goes in, raises this kid from the dead. All these people are morning outside. He goes in, raises them from the dead. The parents will obviously are astonished, and he charged them, tell no one what happened. It must have been difficult. Walk out with this girl that everybody knew was just dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then even the disciples up on Mount Transfiguration, they see Moses and Elijah, they come down. They told no one in those days the things that they had seen. In John, he picks up the same tune when um, Jesus turned the water into wine at the, at the wedding right before he did that. He told his mother this. He said, woman, what is, what is this concern? What does this concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Another place in John, my time has not yet come. Your time is always ready. Mine hasn't come. Again in John, he said, um, Jesus spoke these words in the treasury going on. He says, for his hour had not yet come. But now, as he's riding into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, his hour has come. The time is now. All creation knows. And all creation will sing out. All of creation has been waiting for this event. This event that says your salvation has come. The way of redemption is here. Here he is. Right there. There's all kinds of prophecies that were pointing to this event. Luke mentions a couple of them. Um, here. Uh, we're going to cover a couple of them because I want to sh show you some of the means and how we are to have peace. One, one of the prophecies was a future one, and Jesus told us that one. It's right here. He says, as he drew near, he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Verse 43, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you. They'll surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave, leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So the prophecy Jesus gave and this prophecy came to pass Exactly as he said it, a little less than 40 years after this event. 
In 70 AD, it was actually uh, May 10th, Titus led the, um, General Titus led the um, 10th Legion down into Jerusalem to destroy a rebellion. Fifth Legion was there. A couple of other partial legions were there as well. The Jews at the time were rebelling strongly. There was like a civil war going on in Rome. Titus's father was going to be emperor. Titus will become emperor after him. And so he went in to get a swift and a quick conquest of Jerusalem, just kill the rebellion. Roman way of killing rebellion was squash it. Crush everybody and anybody possible. Let them be an example to all other cities of what not to do to Rome. That's the Roman idea of it. And so his conquest was just that, a crush the rebellion. Um, it lasted about four months actually from May to August, the end of August was right there. There were about upwards of 1.2 million Jews that went into the city at this time. Killed them all. Killed them all. Okay, there were no trees left in and around Jerusalem at the time because they were all used for crosses that they could hang people on. There was also Josephus um, was, was Jewish. He was captured in a northern region during this, this war before 70 AD um, in Galilee, and he became a Roman, uh, a Roman historian after that and also a spy for them. But, but that's a whole other story. Um, he reports that there was no more room left on the roads to hang people because there were so many people crucified. The embankment that they built, out of this, uh, built around the city, complete Romanesque style, starved the people to death. Suffering inside was in, typical of Pax Romana, right, on um, Peace of Rome. Starvation, women eating their own children, brutal treatment. Anybody got caught outside the city, um, they were just torturing, making an example of the people within of what was going to happen to them soon. By the time they went in in late August, the legions, the army, had a blood and greed frenzy going on within them. And they let's see now in, in the Roman armies, you conscripted, um, you were in the army for 20 years, depending upon who the emperor was at the time. It was 20 years or 25 years. That was your length. It wasn't like four years, five year type thing. It was 20, 25 years. And depending upon the wars that you were in, the more wealth you got, because anything you looted was yours. That came to you at the end. And so when they went into a city and they said, Rome said, destroy it, that meant we can have anything we want for ourselves. And that's exactly what they did. There was literally not one stone left upon another on that temple mount. The temple that was supposed to be one of the greatest wonders of the ancient world that was going to outlast the pyramids, some of these stones upwards of 66 tons were pushed overboard over the temple mount because the gold of the temple, when they set it on fire, seeped down into the cracks of the stones. I mean, they destroy it completely. Jesus' prophecy literally, completely fulfilled. And actually, Titus earned himself an uh, um, ark for it. In Rome today, you could go there, and there's a Roman ark of Titus looting um, Jerusalem. The whole battle freezes and all of that. So Jesus gives the prophecy. It comes to pass exactly as he said it would. Another prophecy that we see in the whole passage, we see Jesus coming down, riding on the donkey, on the colt, on, the, on that donkey, Zechariah 9.9 9 specifically speaks of that. Jesus didn't ride into Jerusalem on a stallion that represents power and conquering like most kings would, but he came in riding on a donkey that represents peace, humility. It's one of the reasons why the Romans didn't really care. So what, some Jewish rabbis riding in, people are saying Hosanna to him. I don't care if the whole nation goes out to him as long as there's not war and uprising. So what people sang, Psalm 118, prophetic also of the day. Um, why, 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 do I, why do I mention these? Because if we're going to have real peace in our lives as a follower of Jesus, it is going to be rooted and grounded. It's going to have a foundation from God's Word. And we need to understand that God's Word is God's Word. And it can be trusted completely. Um, and the reason why I mention these things about prophecy is because God alone knows the end from the beginning. A third of this book, a third of it, is prophecy. 
One third. Uh, you, you'll hear people spew out sound bites, and you know, we get so used to these things over time. You know, they'll say, every religion has its holy book, and they all say basically the same thing, or they all claim to be God's word, and it's all just a matter of culture and upbringing, where you were born in the globe, and that's why you hold one thing to be God's word, and other people hold other things to be God's word. No, that's not it. One example in regards to set God's word, I mean, there's lots of examples, but one thing that sets God's word apart from everything else, it's prophecy. No other, quote, holy book has the audacity to state what the future is going to bring. One third of it states what the future is going to be. What Jesus said right here states what the future is going to be. You could be living in Jerusalem at 60 AD and go like, well, what is he talking about? 70 AD, you knew exactly what he was talking about. Only the Bible claims to be God's word. Only the Bible challenges us to recognize that it is God's word. One example, again, is prophecy. God clearly states that he knows the end from the beginning. In Isaiah 41, Isaiah says this, now, during this time, there was a lot of idol worship going on. A lot of the Jews were going off. They were worshiping other things. They've got a lot of, like, things that are higher to them than God. And this, is, this is what God says to them. Present your case, says Yahweh. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Like, let's see them do it. Let them show the former things. Like, you can show the past things and what they were that we might consider them and know the latter end of them. So, you know, the past, look at the present. You keep going and tell me where these things are going. Oh, declare to us things to come. Show the things that are yet, that, that are to come hereafter, that we might know that you are God's. Yes, do good or do evil, that we might be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing. Your work is nothing. Who chooses you, those who choose you, chooses you, is an abomination. And then in verse 26, he kind of ends it out and says, Who has declared from the beginning that we may know, and the former things that we may say, He is righteous? Surely there is no one who shows. There is no one who declares. Surely there is no one who hears your words. Love it when God trash talks. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's saying, go ahead, line up your idols. Go ahead, get all your gods out, and let's have a, let's have a little contest here. Let them speak. Let them tell me your, or tell you what's going to happen in the future. And the reason why I'm pointing this stuff out again is because if, you do, if you're going to stick out from the crowd by moving in life and freedom and in, in, in peace and in joy and in, in life, life, love, that God has, that is God, um, then your foundation has to be in God's word. It's only by seeing what he says and receiving what he says that I'm not going to short circuit the work that he's doing in me. Okay? If I can't trust his word, I'm not going to have security. I, my identity is going to be shifting. My faith, when things get impossible, to the faith of meter starts going, Brr. okay, and you know what? God allows things to get impossible in our lives, just the way that it is. At times, you, you know, we look at things, you've been walking with Jesus more than a week, you know this already, okay, but, but you know, sometimes like God will allow things to get on, you're like, I can't take it anymore, God, I, this, is, this is just too crazy, this is impossible, and then God will let it get a little bit more impossible. Why? There's a few reasons why. One is to show himself strong. He wants us to know that. Another reason is he's working more than just in our lives. He's working in the lives of people around us, and they're watching. And he's testifying to them about who he is. And a third reason, too, is he's trying to build up our faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. Without faith, the Scripture tells us it's impossible to please God. So I'm telling you, these prophecies... Because you need to see one third of this book is prophecy and it's all solid. Here's another prophecy that's happening in that day, probably one of the most remarkable ones. It comes from Daniel chapter 9. So follow me with this. Verse 24, God says this, 70 weeks 
are de- I'm going to tell you what that means in a minute, so just hold on to it. Seventy weeks are determined for, for your people and for your holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, look, Jesus, right there, right? So the, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there's going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. We're going to talk about it in a second. The streets shall be rebuilt again, the wall, even in troublesome time. And after 62 weeks, the Messiah is going to be cut off, executed. That's what that literally means, executed, but not for himself. Well, who for? It's for you and me. Isaiah 53, okay. Um, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be with a flood. Jesus got, got done prophesying about that until the end of the wars and desolations are determined. Let's go back. We'll look at this prophecy from 24. So God says, look, Daniel, there's 70 weeks determined for your people. Daniel was in Babylon at the time. He was in exile. A whole bunch of Israel was in exile because of their disobedience to God. God allowed the Babylonians to take them over, took a whole bunch of people back to Babylon with them. And um, Daniel had been reading Jeremiah, the, the book of Jeremiah. He's been reading God's word. And in God's word, it said right there that we're going to be in exile for 70 years. Daniel's looking at his clock going, hey, God, Seventy years is almost up. And so he starts praying to God about Jerusalem and what's going to happen. And God responds to him by giving him this overview, overview of prophecy of Israel. And so he says this to Daniel. He says, look, Daniel, there are 70 weeks determined for your people and the holy city, for, for, for all of Jerusalem. So this is the time period that I'm giving for you and the, and the whole city. And in that time, this is what's going to happen. By the time it's over, transgression is going to be finished, end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, everlasting righteousness brought up, sealing of vision and prophecy, and the anoint the most holy. Okay, well, we know most of those things aren't done with, are they? Is it the end of sin? There's plenty of sin in the world, right? I mean, is, is there everlasting righteousness in right now? No, there's a lot of wickedness going on in the world. So vision and prophecy, no, we depend upon that every single week. Okay, we read his word. We depend upon prophecy and the teaching of his word. Okay, and then the anointing of the most holy. That's only when Jesus returns. So what's going on? What's going on? God says this. Let's understand this part. Let me just say this about this. Um, The term weak, we we translate it in New King James as weak. Other translations say um, uh, sevens. Um, The term weak is seba in the Hebrew. And what it it means, what it means is just, it's a period of time. It's years. It's seven years. Just like we would say a decade. We use it in context. A decade is ten years. They didn't use decade. They used seba. Okay, so 70 Seven-year periods are determined for your people, um, for, the, for the Holy City. So let's just look at this quick. So a week is a seven-year period of time, and there are 70 seven-year periods of time given. And this is what it's saying, 70 times 7, that is 490 years. And I know some of you, you're going like, is that math? Is it, did, you, did you just put math up on the board? It's okay. It's okay. It's going to be over in a second. I'm not going to make you do any equations. It's all right. Go to the next verse now. So it's 490 years determined for Jerusalem. And now, know, therefore, and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until, there's, there's the, what we want to know, until the Messiah, the Prince, until Jesus comes. There's going to be seven of those seven-year periods of time, and 62 of those seven-year periods of time. Okay, so go back to our formula again. It's 62 and 7. We got that right. 69. It's okay. Don't worry. Times 7, that's 483 years. 483 years until what? Well, it says right there. Until Messiah the Prince. Okay, 483 years. Daniel wrote this 6th century B.C., Okay, if you do the math, you go like, but then that's not accurate, right? You go 6th century B.C., that's over 100 years off then. Well, God didn't say that they're going to start the clock when Daniel gave the prophecy. One other thing about this, and then we move a little bit, and you see how amazing this is in a second. The prophetic year 
in ancient times was based on a 360-day calendar, not 365 and a quarter-day calendar. So it mess up every once in a while. You have to add a month and all of that. And so 463 years, you have to times that by, it's right, until the Messiah comes, but you have to times that by 360 in order to figure out how many days. It's 173,880 days until the Messiah, the Prince, comes. Now, there's a guy um, who did a whole book on this. It's called the, um, the Coming Prince. His name is Sir Robert Anderson. Actually, he became a knight as a result of this work, where he figured out all these days, and he said, okay, when's this, what's this look like? How do we count these days? Take into consideration, you know, leap years, and the year was zero, and the year that was missing, and all that kind of stuff. He did, he did all of that stuff. So what's going on? If Daniel gave this, God said, look, the, it's not going to start, the clock doesn't start count, start." counting at the time of the prophecy, he said, this is when it's going to start, from the going forth of the command to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. That might make everything as clear as mud to you, but in Nehemiah chapter 2, we're given a date here. It came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him. Nehemiah gives his little story here, and Nehemiah is going to go to Artaxerxes in this day and ask Artaxerxes if he can go and take a group of people back to Jerusalem and rebuild it. And he gets permission from them. The date on this was March 14th, 445 BC. According to Daniel's prophecy, God is saying, start the clock. Count off. Count off 173,880 days. And what happens by the time you get to the end of that? This is what happens. You see a crowd of people standing around, Jesus coming down on a donkey, and they're singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Peace in heaven, glory in the, ho- in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. Bam. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what's going on, right? I mean, this is why Jesus said, look, you should have known. This is, your, this is your day. You had the prophecy. You had God's word. You should have known this time of your visitation. Why well, go through all these gymnastics? The works of this, I think that's a mar- remarkable prophecy, by the way. It's one of my favorites. Nobody should have missed the Messiah when he came. It's only one day. You can't be looking for the Messiah today. There's only one day it could happen in all of history. So why go through all these gymnastics on prophecy? Because you and I need to see that God's word is God's word. It doesn't just contain God's word. It is God's word. And we are held responsible for God's word and the revelation of it, even as these first century people were responsible for it. Look, we just went over last week the parable of the Minas. It's an incredible par- parable. If you weren't here, you know, go listen to it on- online, download it or stream it, whatever. Um, and basically, in that parable, we we're told that we're all going to stand before Jesus one day. All of us. Everybody does that. And, you know, we don't want Jesus looking at us and saying to us, you wasted it. You wasted the gift I gave you. You disregarded the calling, the purposes I had planned for you before the foundations of the world. You just completely blew off. You, you just, you wasted the gift I gave you. You, you know, you, you wasted these things. Why? Why? Because you couldn't let go of that hurt? I mean, that's why you wasted all these things? I mean, you wasted them because you, you, you couldn't really forgive that person for what they did to you? Like, really? You, you wasted it because you, you couldn't allow someone to be better than you? Your own pride isolated you? People have to walk around you on eggshells all the time, you know? Like, everybody's scared to talk to you. You know, everybody gets uptight around you. I mean, that's why you wasted it because... because You just couldn't love. I gave you the same power that raised me from the dead. I placed it in you when you came to me. I sealed you with my Holy Spirit. That power is working in you. And you were saying, no, 
the whole time. That's what you were doing. You were looking at my commands and going like, no, that's too hard. Or you were looking at the other people and going, but, but they wronged me. Come on. We wronged him who never did any wrong. And what did the wronged one do to us? He initiated, initiated reconciliation. Initiated it. He initiated it before we ever stepped up. Do you think Jesus is going to ask you to do anything less? Yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. You think he's going to ask you to do anything less? Philippians 2, 5 tells us, let this mind be in you, the same mind that was in Jesus Christ, right? Or another translation says, you must have the same attitude Christ Jesus had. God is going to give every single one of us ample opportunities to initiate love and initiate peace, initiate restoration of relationships. Every one of us. Yet the world, the world is perishing, and the church is anemic. It's not because we're not bold enough. People say, well, we just got to do more. So it's not because we don't have to do more. It's, it's, it's not because there's a crisis going on in the church with church doctrine and truth and all of this stuff. No, Jesus told us. He already told us what the reason was when there was going to be a severe crisis in the church. He told us what was going to happen when the church is going to be anemic looking. He told us what the result, why it was all going to come to pass. It's going to come to pass because we don't love. We just don't believe God's word. See, because Jesus put a whole lot on love, didn't he? In fact, when he's talking to, to people, like he said, look, he said, these are the two greatest commands of love God and love your neighbor. He said, that second one's just like the first. So let's say you love God if you're not, if you're not loving other people. And then even Paul, Paul would, would go on, and he would say in 1 Corinthians 6, he said, 16, he said, let all that, you be, all that you do be done with love. And going on, another place, he says in Galatians 5, he says, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And James gets in on it. He says the same thing. He says, look at you. You really fulfill the royal love according to Scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and you do well. John, John, the apostle John, right, the one who leaned his head on Jesus' breast, the disciple Jesus loved, he says, look, we know we have passed from death to life. We know we have eternal life. Why? Because we love the brethren. He who does not love the, his brother does, abides in wrath. In other words, you don't have any security in your salvation at all if you do not love your brother if you're holding a grudge against somebody, if you hold on to unforgiveness. You don't have any security. Jesus said this. He said, by this all will know that you're mine. Mine. If you love one another, if you have love for one another. So if we don't, what? <laughs> what do we have? What are we doing? John, I wrote first John, Gospel of John, one, two, three, John. He was a, he was a bishop in, um, in Ephesus. He only one of the disciples that wasn't martyred. They tried to kill him. He just wouldn't die. They put him in boiling oil, supposedly, you know, tradition tells us. Um, he was 90-something. He's almost, almost dead. Um, he would still teach at various churches. And you can imagine the in incredible excitement it must have been to see John who talked with Jesus, leaned on Jesus, touched him. And here he is, 90. And he would teach at the churches. Um, and there's re re records of him being carried up because he couldn't walk any longer. And, he, and they would carry him up to the front of, of the churches. And he would teach. He would just look around at people. And he would say, my little children... And he would just say, love one another. I think that was it. Just love one another. And he was done. Short sermon. I could have, I could have got this done in two seconds. Um, 
But, is, that, but that was all they did. And yet, the world's going to know that we're his disciples by our love for one another, and yet we can be so easily offended. Really? Really? The power of the resurrection that's in me. God initiated this reconciliation. I am now a minister, an ambassador of Jesus Christ. I have this ministry of reconciliation, and I'm easily offended. We can hold on to hurts. We can be wrong to not initiate re- reconciliation. We, we can say, well, I'll be reconciled to that person if they jump through, and then we hold up the hoops. And we're going to judge how well they jump through my hoops. God looks at us and he goes, you're my enemy. You're my enemy. You're making hoops up for people when I've given you the power to forgive. We're his enemies. And I can't forgive. I can't love. I can't offer that sacrificial love, esteeming others more than myself for my spouse. I can't do that really for my spouse. I can't do that for my child. I can't really. I can't do that for a sibling of one of my, we haven't talked in how long. I can't do that for, I can't do it for a fellow brother or sister. I can't do it with the person I work with or my neighbor. I can't do it. Jesus didn't tell us these things so that we would go home and say, oh, I've really got to try. I've got to try to be a better Christian. I've got to go lay a golden egg or something like that. Um, he told us these things because like he told his disciples that day when they were looking at the Sea of Galilee, he says, we're going to the other side. So yeah, things are going to get messy. Things are going to get tough. Yeah, there's a storm going to hit. It's okay. You know, the water's going to come in the boat. You're going to think you're going to drown, all that kind of stuff. It's, I told you, going to the other side. I told you to love other. I'm not asking you to do something. I'm not giving you the power to do. So just let me. See, we're called to stick out. So stick out. Love. Let peace reign in your heart. God's commands are what he desires to do in us. Look, when we grasp this, when we, when we realize his instructions that he's giving, his instructions are going to happen, his commands he's enabling us to do, then we could just abide. We go, all right, God, do it in me. You're going to give me opportunity, God, do it. Anyone can hold on to a grudge. Anyone could say that person didn't mean what they said by saying, I forgive you, or this, or maybe they didn't even ask that at all. Um, Anybody can make another person prove themselves. Anybody can be angry and bitter. Anybody can. Jesus has for us to learn the art of sticking out. He's called us to be more. Let's pray. So, Jesus, um, we, we, we... Thank you, Jesus, for the love that you've shown us. Even now as we're going to celebrate that with communion, God, um, we thank you for that. We thank you that you do these things in us, God. And you know us, Lord. You know how we have all these little excuses going on in, in our mind of how we are just ripping ourselves off from the love that you have for us and from the works and the, and the, um, de- the, the, the life that you have for us. We don't want to play that game any longer, Lord. We just want to let go of it. We don't want to stand before you one day and just go, oh, yeah, I should have just let it go. We want to do it now. And we trust by the power of your resurrection you can do that in us. So we ask for that right now. I ask for those who don't know you here right now, Jesus, that you would just reveal yourself and that you would just be speaking to them and assuring them that you have heard their cries and even have met them here. We love, we love the work that you do. We love you, Jesus. And we thank you for this time together. Bless our time of communion. In Jesus' name, amen.